it's like these parents are young. I'm like, these people, you're for sure like limited chance of getting adopted when you're a teenager, especially if you've had a failed adoption. And I'm trying to look like I have this big love for God, but like deep down inside. So in walks in my future husband. This was family from the very beginning. Years into going to this church, um, my parents got a divorce. It was a devastating blow. And he started listening to this podcast called Blurry Creatures. All of a sudden I felt the Holy Spirit settle on me and that rubber band snap into place. And I was like, oh my gosh, Jordan, God is real. <sighs> Man, okay, <laughs> we're gonna see if I can actually like wrap this part up. This is not a depressing episode. I think I'm gonna be able to wrap it up in this episode. Everybody's probably like, yay! finally this is gonna be a, like a more condensed down version I've shared parts of it on my Instagram already so if you follow me over there you're gonna be familiar with this part of my story before we get started go ahead and give the video a thumbs up and then subscribe if you haven't already and then you can follow me over on Instagram if you want to keep up with more of like my um, counterculture videos more encouragement when it comes to Christianity as a whole I talk more about it over there but today we're gonna wrap up the part of my story that really hits on just how much God like when I say that he moved mountains mountains for me I mean that he moved mountains for me like he completely shifted my life like when when I would left off last week I was talking about how I had like left the house of horrors I was um, adopted and then I was put back into foster care after I went back into foster care I I really I, I mentioned it but I kind of mentioned it more in passing and that when you come back into foster care you really it, it's gonna be a really hard thing to get you placed if you're a teenager I was 14 years old I had a history of just having like behavioral issues I came back into care and I not only didn't have to go into like a group home I went into immediately into a an actual home two parents other kids I went back into 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 a shelter and I got a call one day and these that I had a place to go and I was like wow okay an actual family and I pull up to this family's house and it's like these parents are young I'm like, these people, I, you want me to view them as parents, but they're like older brother and sister, like parents of the home were like in their mid twenties and 12 year age difference. Um, end up moving in with this family and they had uh, some uh, some little kids that were in the home and then they had a, another girl that was older than me. I mean, I wasn't the only teenager that this young couple had. Um, so I was like, all right, well, but something that was different about this family is that, that there was a lot of structure in the home. They, they had um expectations of the of the kids living in their home and like i said in my last video like discipline and structure is not a punishment for your children but it's really a gift for your children i'm at this house and it's the summertime and they're gonna go across country for the mom's brother it's his it's his wedding he's getting married and the state let me go across the country with him i've never even been out of the tri-state area i'm from arkansas i've never been out of the tri-state area never seen the coast or really anything at least from what i can remember nothing in my memory uh i couldn't remember going and I get to like experience like family and and see them interact with each other when we we came back after going to this wedding and I really got to experience family they sat me down the mom and the dad sat me down they asked me if I really didn't want to be adopted again because at this point I had a court appointed advocate for me a casa worker and she was working with me to become independent living because not only is it hard to get placed at all like you're for sure like limited chance of getting adopted when you're a teenager, especially if you've had a failed adoption. I, my hope for having a family was pretty much like non-existent. I, I didn't think that it was possible for it to happen. So I just made, like I made it seem like I didn't even want it to happen. Like, oh, it's not really possible, but I'm gonna act like I'm in control. I'm making the decision for myself. So I'm gonna do independent living. The parents sat me down and said, we will adopt you if you wanna be adopted. We don't, we won't force you to be adopted, but, but like if you're, you're truly saying you don't wanna be adopted because you don't want to be, we respect that. But if you're saying it because you don't think that it's gonna happen like we will we will adopt you and I was like it wasn't I didn't even have to go and think about it I was like uh yes I had been lying to myself that whole time oh I don't want to be adopted I don't want anything to do with that but that was the total lie because I wanted to be adopted I just set that my expectations low because I thought I don't want to be disappointed that you're supposed to have a foster child in your home for at least six months before you're allowed to adopt them but my family and my parents were moving across the country for my dad's job sooner than the six months and the state actually gave them special permission to adopt me early and so i got adopted in december of 2010 2010 yeah december of 2010 this is some of the best memories of my entire life some of the most hard parts too 
where I really had to do a lot of growing and learning. We started attending a church called Sun Valley. Why am I crying? I literally talk about this church all the time. We started going to a church called Sun Valley. It's in Yakima, Washington. And if you need a church home and you're in Yakima, like you should go. It's a phenomenal church. But anyways, my, me and my family, we move up here. We start going to Sun Valley and I'm homeschooled, okay? One of the best things that ever happened to me was being homeschooled because I did, like my parents realized they can't have other kids be the influence in my life. They had to be the influence in my life. You had bad things happen to you when you were a kid. You had a lot of things where you, you know, you were a victim in those situations, but you can't be a victim for the rest of your life. Like you have to allow God to like come in and work on your life and you, the victim mentality, not, not allowing that to be a part of like my mindset was one of the best things that my parents ever did for me was to hold me, tell me to hold my accountable to my own actions. Like I always say now, um, when I talk about any type of trauma is that the trauma that you experienced and being a victim of that trauma or those circumstances, those aren't your fault, but your reaction is uh, 100% your responsibility. Like what you do afterwards is 100% your responsibility. And a lot of that stems from me knowing that that works. Already, I was set way ahead. Okay, I'd never had parents that held me accountable to my actions and my parents did. Um, my parents weren't perfect, but they gave me that foundational thing and they, they, they did not save me, but they introduced me to what a real relationship with Christ looked like. And it wasn't some watered down version of, of what being a Christian was. And, and so I'm going to, I start going to youth group. I start going to youth group and I meet one of my very best friends that I've had for a really long time. I realize I, there's something different about this church. There's something different about this Jesus than the Jesus that I realized when I was in the Bible Belt. That's why, cause I, I told you I'm from Arkansas, from Northwest Arkansas. I may not sound like it. If I get around my family, I 100% sound like it. I moved to a spot where like not everybody's a Christian. If you're a Christian up there, you're choosing to be a Christian. And it really was where the rubber hit the road of is this God something that is a part of like what I had in my religion before and just like my culture or is this real? I start taking it seriously, but I'm still living this double life. It's part of just being honest with you. I put my parents on a pedestal. I put my parents on a pedestal and I I put other adults in my life on a pedestal and I wanted to to please them. I wanted to be I wanted to be accepted and so I tried to be as good of a person as possible but behind the scenes I was living this double life and I was sleeping with my boyfriend, lying to my parents about the relationships that I was having with other people because it, in our home we did biblical courtship and didn't do the dating scene. We didn't do recreational dating and now as as a mom and having done it correctly, I know exactly why we didn't do that. But for a long time, I kind of lived with this horrible gut-riching guilt. I was trying to be a good youth group lead, like kid. I was attending, um, we were, I was in Shadowland Society, which was like a the, uh, theology and apologetics, trying to work on my faith, but my faith wasn't my own at that point. Several years pass and um, we left Sun Valley. We were gonna move back home. At this point, I was very much trying to live like a Christian. I was trying to look like a Christian. I was trying to be like a Christian and I was genuinely trying, but I don't know that my faith was truly manifesting in itself. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't real to me. Like the ideas were real, but the actual experience and like actually having an anointing from the Holy Spirit, I don't know that I actually had that, which was kind of terrifying to me because I was looking around at everybody else and I was like, man, everybody else is just like freaking, it seems like they just have this huge love for God. And I'm trying to look like I have this big love for God, but like deep down inside, like, I don't think I love God. Like, I don't know that I loved really a whole lot of people. I cared what they thought of me, but I wondered if I ever truly loved them. Uh, anyway, so, so we, we are going to move back to the area because my dad came back home for work and back home as in like back to Arkansas for work. And he moved back. We actually stopped in Kansas and stayed with my grandparents. My parents were gonna build a house and it was gonna be like their forever home. And at this point, me and my mom, we were very close. Um, we were very close friends. I'm 18 at this point. I turned 18 right before we moved back, back to Kansas. And we're just like here for a pit stop. We're not even gonna stay for very long. I go to like a young, uh, young, people's ministry, young adults, young adults ministry, if I can talk. I literally get butterflies even 10 years later. So in walks in my future husband. He was funny. He, everybody liked him. He was kind. He served and he was a young adult who was going to church as a single man, he was going anyways. Like he wasn't going because he was going with people. He was going, like he was out on his own. He's doing it because he wants to be there. And I was like, I 
something in me told me like i i don't know what it is about him um one thing that is, like i said before is that we we did biblical courtship so in my family we didn't do the recreational dating we did we did like dating with a purpose or biblical courtship and so we would be um i before i even like pursued anything with Jordan, who is my husband. I had that life that I felt like I was living like a double life and there was something in me. I believe it now to be the Holy Spirit because of what it, what happened and, and like the shifting in me. But at the time I was like still searching. There was something in me that was like, you have to be honest with your parents about what, like that you basically lied. Because I knew with this person, the next person that I was gonna be with, I was hoping that this would be a person to pursue marriage with or somebody that like, I don't just want it to be another for funsies relationship. I wanted to have purpose and meaning. And in order for that to happen, I have to be completely honest about what happened before. And so one night telling my mom at my grandparents' house, I just told her everything. I had made this vow to myself and she knew about it that I didn't even want to kiss my first husband because, I mean, my, uh, I didn't want to kiss my future husband or anybody um because i wanted to save it until the altar i didn't i didn't have that to give like the virginity part of it there was just something that i wanted to have that was sacred that was a gift not only to myself but to my husband and not only did i not do that with this last person and lied to her about it like it went way beyond the, that like as far as you can go at this point jordan and i were talking and she was like you're not only gonna have to be honest with me you're gonna have to be honest with him all of him and one thing led to another and we ended up going over to his house and sitting down and he had no idea what was happening. Um, but we knew that in order to keep my relationship with him to the standard that we wanted, our courtship was gonna look a lot different than regular dating. And if he wanted to be interested in pursuing a relationship with me, that the standards were gonna be so, so high because I had lowered them so, so low. If you're in it, like I'm in it and we can have a, like we can pursue possibly having a relationship. I don't wanna mess around and I don't want you to waste your time. And no joke, this man <laughs> is sitting there and he's just looking. We just dropped a freaking bombshell on this man. He's like, he was like, that's fine. I'm okay with that. The way I had to like pick my job off the floor. I don't even remember like the, there was no like questions. Like we pretty much laid everything out. Like where this is how it would go. Like this is what happened. This is why. And he's just, okay. I respect that and I respect you. That was enough for him. He didn't shy away because the the standard was too high. The expectation of him was too high. He started courting in March, got engaged in July. We got married October 4th. Married in 2014. So we'll actually be celebrating 10 years of marriage this year. Wow, that's weird. We have three kids together now and I'm just like, pfft, my brain is absolutely baffled. Several years go by and we have our first child together and we went over the road and there was like a point in time because my husband drove commercially for a while that like we didn't see him for a month at a time. And then sometimes we'd go out on the road with him, but then I got pregnant with my daughter and my son started really missing him, started, you know, asking where his daddy all the time. He was getting to that point where when Jordan would leave, he would lose his mind. I was living with my parents at the time so that we could save up money. That was just the moment where it was like, okay, we're gonna have to look for a new job because we can't keep living this life where we don't see you. I'm basically a single parent most of the time. Our son needs you, our daughter's gonna need you. No amount of money is better substitute for you. He actually found a job in a town that was like north of where I was living at the time and where we were living, he was home sometimes. But at first we had planned to live like not far from my parents. We had 50 acres that we were gonna build on. Just something in us new, like, no, we're gonna move to this town um, that's north. It was further away from family. Kind of forced us to just not be like use my family as a crutch. When I tell you everything fell into place from buying the house to it being in the exact place that we needed to be, we had no idea about this town that we moved into. Now we have to look for a church. We hadn't been going to a church for a while and we were lost because we knew that we needed a community, but for our entire marriage, we hadn't really had like a really solid church to go to. We move in and that very first Sunday that we're here, I told Jordan, I'm like so pregnant. I'm just like, we gotta find a church. I hate church hunting. I hate going and like meeting new people and the small talk and everybody's asking you questions and you don't know anybody, but everybody else knows everybody. It's just daunting. We go and we're literally driving to that church that Sunday. We got Joby in the back seat. I'm like, you know what? We pulled up we're like a block away and I'm like I'm just gonna look like we didn't actually look at their um like their belief system 
like having that online like if you want to root out churches if it's going to be a good for, fit for you pull up their website and look what do we believe because that's a big telling sign um and there were some like actual unbiblical things that this church believed those are not things those are non-negotiables and i was like well, what are we gonna do and i looked at jordan and i was like well church is nearby and there was a church literally a block back and i was like oh, because i was like well, we're gonna go to church like i don't care we're going to church today we turn around we go to this church like first Sunday there, there's nothing wrong with mega churches, okay? But like, if you're like me going to a church where like, you know your pastor's name and your pastor knows you, that's incredibly important. Like to have a relationship with who is the shepherd of your flock, it, it like, it's incredibly important. The pastor, this is the 2020. And so like, uh, they had just started church back up and he comes and he like approaches me and Jordan and he said, I'm so happy to meet you. Um, the following Sunday, like we came back, he, he was like, I really want you to meet my wife. My wife wasn't here last week, she comes up to Jordan she's like well let's go out to lunch and I'm like oh being at like being at church anyways at all like meeting new people is super uncomfortable sometimes but like now we're gonna go out to lunch You're like all right we go out to lunch with him and we left and I was like this is it I don't know what it is about this church this is it we only had to visit one church we've been at that church for almost four years now we started a small group. The small groups weren't even going at the time, but um, we started a small group and I have never experienced love like at this small group. And I have great relationship with my sister. I have a good relationship with my dad. But th this type of love, this agape love, this was family from the very beginning. You could tell it was. Years into going to this church, um, my parents got a divorce. And in 2022, when my parents told me they were getting a divorce, I had seen it coming. It was a devastating blow. I want to respect my parents. And so I won't talk about why, the why. I went to my small group and I was like, man, I went by myself that night. I don't even know why I went by myself. I just knew like, I need to go. I don't know why the kids couldn't come. And I told my small group, like my parents are getting a divorce. And I like just started bawling. <laughs> And I felt ashamed because I wanted to support my parents. I wanted to love my parents. I wanted to, I don't know. There was biblical grounds for a divorce, but nonetheless, the consequences of that divorce were absolutely devastating. Whenever I was going through that, of just feeling like, man, what the heck is family? What is family? My family showed up in my small group. So when people say like, well, I don't need to go to church in order to experience God. No, but you might block a blessing that God has for you and other believers that love him like you do. There is nobody that can love you like somebody that loves the Lord. The way they stepped in and the way that God placed these people in my life, two years into this, kind of had a fallout, falling out with my mom. Our relationship, looking back, I struggle with how it looked. I wanna respect my mom's and it's still an ongoing thing, so I won't go deep into that, but just know that I really struggled. I struggled with knowing like, well, what are parents? How are parents supposed to be? What is family supposed to look like? I told them I'm struggling with my faith. I feel like I have been a cultural Christian I feel like I don't love other people. Like Jesus says to love other people. Like I'm not experiencing that. I look at other people and I want what they have, but it's very obvious to me that I don't have what they have. Am I a Christian? I'm trying to be obedient to what God says, but I, I'm trying for the sake of doing what Christians do. And I'm trying to have faith, but I, I don't know that I have any. My church family was, they prayed for me and they prayed for me and they prayed for me and they gave me good solid advice. They pointed me in the right directions of books to look into. How do you think? Like what is, where is God gonna show you who he is? My husband, he is a, a Christian. He loves the Lord. He thinks a lot differently than me. So sometimes like we don't come to the Lord in the same spaces, but he started listening to some podcasts about things that were going on in the world, the world in general. And he started listening to this podcast called Blurry Creatures. And if you haven't listened to it, it's very like, you can take it or leave it on some things, which I do, but it's approached Christianity, like Dr. Michael Heiser, made me realize that for so long, I didn't take the spiritual world as real. I didn't acknowledge it as real. I didn't think it was real. I had a very like a cold, 
sterile approach to Christianity. Like there's me and there's a God somewhere and I'm going to try to seek after him instead of realizing that like the spiritual world is all around us. But Jordan starts listening to Blurry Creatures and he listens to a Michael Heiser podcast and it's talking about some of the things that happened there um, with like the Genesis 6 story. During this time, I'm starting to listen to him. He's like, you should listen to this podcast. You should listen to this podcast. And he's encouraging me. He's encouraging me. My dad actually got remarried. We go over to his house, him and his wife's house for Christmas Eve. And I'm looking at my siblings and and they're telling me about this person that my mom married that I don't know. This is so baffling to me that like my siblings know this person and have this whole life and I'm, you know, an adult and I, I don't have a relationship with my mom anymore and I don't have a relationship with this person she married. And I just, it felt, it was heartbreaking to me. Felt so emotionally vulnerable. We left their, their house that Christmas Eve and we came home and we were about to go to bed. I mean, we had been laying there for 10 minutes in silence. And for some reason, I brought up Michael Heiser. Imagine a rubber band, you're stretching it, you're stretching it, you're stretching it and you let it go and it snaps. That is what it was like while I was lying in bed with Jordan and all of these things for all of these years led up to this like cataclysmic event to where it became so physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually real all at one time. We, I talked to him about Michael Heiser when we were talking and then I just started spouting things off. All of a sudden I felt the Holy Spirit settle on me and that rubber band snap into place. And I was like, oh my gosh, Jordan, God is real. And he was like, you're freaking me out. You're freaking me out right now. I don't know what all you're saying because you're saying a bunch of different things all at once. And it, I had an actual encounter with God in this moment and it, everything changed for me in this moment. And when I tell you, God became very, he's always been real, but he showed me just how real he was in that moment. My life completely changed in that moment. I experienced the love. I experienced the amount of peace I could never experience. I, it was like I had not been able to see and I put on a pair of glasses. Only I didn't see things blurry. I saw things black. I saw nothing. I put on a pair of glasses and then the world was colorful. That is what it felt like in that moment. And and it has become a harder during some days, but every single day since that moment happened, I want to read the word. I prayed for a long time, God, help me to get into your word. But when I could really acknowledge him, acknowledge his presence, and it was a real thing, a real being I'm having a conversation with, then I believed in what I was saying to him and I believed that he would answer my prayers. And I wanted to be in scripture. And ever since that moment happened, I've realized that I've been called to speak to other people about Jesus. I didn't love other people before. I've recently shared that the reason that I was not vocal about Jesus before was because I didn't love other people. I didn't, I was told I would never be able to be capable of loving other people. And, and the reason that I didn't share Jesus before was because I didn't really believe what I was saying, I was just trying to save myself from hell. I didn't really want to have a relationship with God. I wanted to have a relationship that was safe after death. In case something was real after death, I wanted to make sure I had my checkbox marked, right? It wasn't real. Even in all these things, God was there every single step of the way. People say, oh, hey, talk so much about God. People that have been healed talk about what healed them. And even in those moments when I didn't understand that it was God who was healing me, I didn't understand that it was God that was showing up to save me from having to go to that group home, to save me with parents that were willing to step up and show me and exp like, tell me about Jesus, to have parents that held me to a higher standard, to put me in a church where I have people that say, I love you like you are my daughter. I choose to love you like you are my daughter. That, that, that love my children like grandparents. People who love Jesus. And then the connection came alive to me that I, I can know these people and I can love these people because of the connection that we have through Jesus Christ. I'm okay with people thinking that I'm nuts. I'm okay with people saying like, oh, you're just over spiritualizing everything. No, I'm not over spiritualizing everything. Spiritual world is very real. Sometimes God comes to people and, and it's not, super hard to have that transition, but I'm a doubting Thomas, okay? And that's just who I am. You think the people that are disciples like, oh, I'd be Simon Peter cutting people's ears off. Like I can relate to that. And I can also say, I'll believe Jesus rose from the dead when I see it with my own eyes. I had to physically experience it. And it was terrifying to me because I saw these other people that were experiencing it. I didn't have it in me. The beautiful part about it is people say, well, what did you do? What'd you do this? How'd you do this? I didn't do anything. In that moment when that rubber band snapped together, it was because I just, I sought him out and sought him out and sought him out even when I couldn't feel him in that moment. And so if you are like, I don't know if God, like I'm not experiencing God. Like I want to believe, I want to continue to want to believe God will 
carry you. Faith for some people can be an overnight thing, okay? They can be completely atheists one moment and then not the next. But for some people, it takes a long period of time. If the doubting Thomas, who's walked with Jesus, knows Jesus, has seen what Jesus does, and yet they still aren't sure. But God is faithful. If you say, please, I surrender. He can do a lot more with our surrender than he can do with our control. In those moments when I felt like I would never have the relationship like what other people had, instead of saying, oh, well, it must be because it's just not real. I had to realize like, it's God who has to do the legwork of my faith first. I can't seek God and find God on my own terms. I can't make my faith with God. Faith is a gift from God. I'm telling you this as somebody who is an analytical thinker. I'm a facts-based thinker. If you search for him and the questions of the universe and science and philosophy and cosmology and spirituality and relationships and love, he is there in every single one of those things. And people will say, oh, well, this disproves it. And this is, it doesn't. God has not finished with those who want to seek him, who want to know him. If you want to know him, he will let you. Surround yourself with people that are genuinely praying for you. Find a church. I know it's difficult. I know it's hard. If the church doesn't feel right, if it feels corrupt, leave. But if the church just feels uncomfortable, it might be a you thing, okay? I'm not saying don't listen to the spirit, but sometimes the enemy is getting in there and he's playing on that uncomfortableness to make you want to leave and get back to being comfortable. But being a Christian means being uncomfortable. It means dying to ourselves, dying to all of our beliefs. You have to let go of reason in order to believe in Jesus Christ. You have to let go of your pride. But I want, I have to want Jesus more than I have to want my own pride, more than I want to have to want my own control. Jesus is always there. Jesus is always faithful from me being born and my mother leaving two months in to me just having an absolute faith crisis and my entire family being up in flames. God has always been there. Every single moment, every single step, the drugs, the alcohol, God saved me. He snatched me from it every single time, time and time again. Like I shouldn't even be here. And yet God kept coming back for me. I love you. I love you. I love you. This is your family. Those that love me, they are your family who you will rejoice with in heaven. They are who will be in my presence. They are eternal. That relationship with the person, the connection between Christians, me and you, if we're both Christians, our connection is eternal. That's why the relationship between believers and the relationship between God, it transcends anything that the world can come up with as a version of family. We are all adopted. We are all relying on his goodness and his faithfulness. And if I had, can see it in every single aspect of my life where God protected me, better mom now because of what I've gone through. I can relate to other children who are going through things. I have seen the nitty gritty underbelly of America, of poverty, to where now God has done great things in my life, but I can come and I can give hope and people can see that in the darkness of my own past, God's light was shining bright.